Yeah, I was just going to make sure. Well, what I did last time was at the end. Last time there was no attendance. Last week's session. I mean, we nobody. Uh, well, that's what he says, yes. Well, I, I actually, I've talked to him once, but Lord, I have to call back. Uh, I think I may have been doing something wrong. I'm going to talk to him again today. But we had a room to call him. You would just call and then enter through the ID, and then he would send you a text message. And ask you who you are, essentially. I do this right now. <laughs> well, I'm going to call him today and be sure that, actually, I think I've been doing it wrong. But he said he could. You're back. Oh, yeah. 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 So how's, how was this one going? Yes. Basically, you were there. Were you in this one? No, no. I, I, I go there very often. I didn't think this was going to happen. Well, the, the World Stroke Conference, I mean, what could be better? <laughs> <laughs> so, you're not on the schedule today, are you? No. I um, have to see if there's some time we can get you to visit. All morning, I'll, I'll leave it morning. Okay. Okay. I'm going to steal it. You think this is going to wreck the system? It used to be easy. Oh, wait. Can I just. That's changing the source. No, I think you can do it any time once it started. You know, once it's eight o'clock. We're all ready to go, I guess. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and, and get started. Um, since I have, as usual, clinic 
<laughs> patients waiting on me this morning. So, um, so I'm going to uh, do a, kind of a fun topic this morning. For those who don't know me, I'm Mark Pippinger. I'm a behavioral neurologist. So we're the worst kind of neurologist, I think. Um, we're the ones that deal with cognition and behavior. So we sort of bump, bump into psychiatry, as it were. And uh, the topic that I'm going to talk about today really is kind of closer into the world of psychiatry. I promise there'll be a neurological angle as we go through. But uh, I thought it would be fun to talk about, since today happens to be Halloween, um, I thought it'd be fun just to talk about um, a little bit about Halloween as an introduction. I'm, I'm quite fond of pointing out to people that, you know, many people that know me personally know that I'm interested in Irish stuff, Irish music and Irish culture. Um, and I'm fond of pointing out that Halloween is probably the most Irish holiday that we celebrate in the United States. So if you look at the customs and traditions associated with this holiday, they're virtually all derived from, from Ireland and the Irish culture. Um, whereas St. Patrick's Day, as it's celebrated in the United States, has virtually no resemblance at all to the Irish celebrations with no traditions derived from Ireland, so, you know, to speak of, so other than the name of the holiday and the consumption of alcohol. So other than that, uh, St. Patrick's Day is fully American. But Halloween, on the other hand, most of our traditions came from Ireland. Um, Halloween, of course, is a contraction of, of Hallow's Even, or the Eve of All Hallow's Day, or All Saints' Day, also known in England and Ireland as Hallowmas. Um, and this actually originally derived from a holiday in the Catholic Church that was created to celebrate the deaths of all of the saints. Initially, in the, I guess it was the seventh century or so, Pope Boniface, I think it was, designated All Martyrs Day, which was May the 13th. And later, about 150 years later, Pope Gregory III said, well, let's move that to November 1st, and we'll expand it to include all of the saints, as well as the martyrs. So the saints and martyrs, so it became All Saints Day. He made it November 1st, probably, to meld it with several <laughs> pagan festivals, which occurred around that time of the year. As you may know, the Catholic Church is expert at trying to correlate their celebrations with pagan celebrations, and thereby attempt to obliterate the pagan belief by absorbing it into Catholic. So that's where we came up with All Saints Day on November 1st. And later, in around the first millennium, um, All Souls Day was created on the 2nd of November. And so that was right following All Saints Day. So from the Eve, um, All Hallows' Eve, through to All Souls' Day, we have the triduum of All Hallows' Tide, which is the time in the Catholic Church calendar for celebration of the dead to celebrate the passing of uh, the saints, the passing of loved ones. Uh, and this actually correlates also to several other cultural celebrations like the Day of the Dead in Mexico. So the Day of the Dead festivals in Mexico parallel this almost exactly. And so at any rate, um, the Celtic influence, the Irish influence, comes really from the ancient Irish or the Celts. Their harvest festivals around this time of year recognize the end of one year and the beginning of the next as Samhain, and Samhain was the Celtic New Year. It was considered that at this time of the year, the veil between this world and the next world was opened and souls were allowed to return to the earth. So you have the souls of the departed who came back, and that will influence some of the customs because those souls may be your family who come back to visit you, and you want to feast with those uh, departed souls, but they may be people you owed money to or that you did something bad to, so you want to hide out from those guys and you don't want to be found by them. Or they may be evil spirits, and so you want to avoid those. Um, the customs, the activities and customs that we celebrate here include dressing up in costumes. The practical reason for doing that as an ancient Irish person was to avoid detection by those wandering spirits. So you left the house, you didn't want to be recognized by those evil spirits or by the people who are looking for you to exact revenge. And you'll find in all of the primitive cultures this, this notion of the dead returning to take revenge. And that figures especially in English and Irish folklore, 
So as a listener to English and Irish ballads and folk ballads, I can tell you almost all of the, or about a third to a half of those songs include some version of a dead person coming back as a spirit to take revenge against whoever made them a dead person. So anyway, um, so dressing up in costumes has a practical value. It could be also that you just dress as evil spirits so you blend in with the evil spirits. And so there's a couple of reasons for the costumes. The custom of trick-or-treating uh, also comes from probably England and Ireland. And in England, it's known as souling. So at this time of year, children would go from house to house and would beg for food. And these were often uh, poor children. They would beg, beg for food, and the householder would bake little cakes at that time called soul cakes and would give out the soul cakes in return for the promise that they would pray for the souls of their dead relatives. And so uh, that sort of turned into the trick-or-treating for candy that we do. In Scotland, they call it guising. So you can see disguise, so it's like they're costumed and they travel from house to house. In England and Ireland, the tradition is that when the child comes to the house, however, they have to perform in order to get their treat. So the trick or treat in Ireland is sort of the other way around. The child does the trick, as in reciting a poem, singing a song, or doing a little skit, and then the, the householder gives them a treat which could be a baked good, like um, uh, the soul cake, or nowadays it's candy. And so, and that tradition actually survives in St. Louis, I'm told. Around St. Louis, children are expected to sing little songs or tell jokes before they get their candy at the door, which is interesting. So, and how it came to St. Louis, I don't know. The jack-o'-lanterns that we see, the carved pumpkins, come from the, the Irish uh, story of Jack, who tricked the devil into climbing up a tree and then carved a cross on the trunk of the tree so the devil couldn't get down. And uh, he promised to let the devil down if the devil promised not to take him into hell. So after Jack died, he'd been a very bad boy since he knew he wasn't going to hell. He just did whatever he wanted to do. But he couldn't be let into heaven because he'd been such a bad boy. And the devil wouldn't take him into hell because he promised. So he was banned to roam the earth. And... Um, uh, the devil gave him an, an eternal ember from the fires of hell to light his way and help warm him. So Jack carved out a turnip and put the ember in the turnip to carry it around. So the Irish used to carve turnips, and they'd carve these elaborate faces into the turnip, and it would uh, hopefully ward off the evil spirits. Turnips in Ireland, by the way, are quite a bit bigger than they are here in America, so they're quite large. However, when the Irish discovered pumpkins coming from America, they thought, this is great because these are already hollow. All you've got to do is scoop out the seeds, and it's easier to carve. And so the pumpkin rap rapidly took over from the, the turnip. Uh, the custom of bobbing for apples probably dates back to the Roman occupation of Ireland and Britain, in which um, uh, the Romans celebrated the goddess Pomona, who was the goddess of the apple, more or less, or represented by the apple. So the custom of bobbing for apples was an ancient Irish custom. And in fact, in the southwest of Ireland, in Kerry and Schlieblukra, um, the Halloween is known as Snapapple. And this time of year, in Snapapple, people get together, they bob for apples, they play music, they drink, and they try to tell their fortunes. So a big part of Halloween is telling fortunes for the future. And, of course, around Britain and Ireland, there's the lighting of bonfires, which fortunately, I think, didn't happen too much where I grew up in northeast Arkansas. <laughs> so, um, but uh, the lighting of bonfires was considered an integral part of the celebration in Ireland. Um, people would gather around the bonfires, again, to tell stories and to help predict their future, to try to tell the future in various ways that uh, we could talk about. But an interesting custom in Ireland was that all of the hearth fires of the homes in that village would be extinguished on the night of Halloween, and then they would be relit using fire taken from the communal bonfire. That was seen as a way of trying to cement the community together to provide unity for the community. And you don't realize that back then it was very important. The hearth fire was critical because you'd freeze to death or not be able to cook your food, and so extinguishing the fire and then relighting it in this way was a, was a very uh, significant matter of trust. So all of these activities uh, come from Ireland, originally in the ancient Irish, and many of these we see today in America. 
as in the costumes, the trick-or-treats, the jack-o'-lanterns, and maybe bobbing for apples. I don't know. Did anybody hear bob for apples when they were young? So um, I, I, they used to do that, but I never uh, participated in that particular thing. So at any rate, so that's the, my little story on Halloween and how it comes from Ireland. So uh, let's get to the, to the actual meat of the thing. I want to go on and talk about these three types of monsters. I'm going to provide a little a lot of folklore, and I promise there will be a neurological angle. <laughs> so just so we keep it legal, as it were. So um, let's start off and just talk about vampires. Uh, the vampire is um, a mythical being who feeds on the life essence of others, and usually that's blood. Um, there are some of the old legends which hold that they take some kind of spiritual essence, but most of the time these are beings which feed on the blood of living beings. Now in some of the legends these are beings which have come back from the dead, in other legends they're not. Uh, they're people that just transform into the vampire. It's an old idea and it's found throughout the world in various cultures. So the term vampire itself comes probably from the 18th century originally in Eastern Europe, but there are words for vampires in almost every culture around the world. So these stories date back all the way to uh, the uh, ancient Mesopotamians, the Greeks, the Romans. They all talk of beings who uh, would feed on the blood of others, and they'd be recognizable as precursors to this. But the more modern vampires arose mainly in the 17th century and uh, uh, 18th century, and focused in Eastern Europe and in the Slavic lands uh, more than any other area. So, and we associate them with the Balkans, with Transylvania, the Carpathian Mountains. Generally, these are held to be revenants. So a revenant is someone who's been brought back from the dead, basically. So revenants of either evil beings, maybe they're suicide victims, or maybe they're witches who have been executed and then come back from the dead to feed on the blood of others. So the old legends are a little different than our movie vampires. It was believed that when the vampire returned to the living, they would go back to home first. Um, there was also a lot of sexual connotation to the existence of the vampire, and it was believed that this might be a conjugal visit. So the vampire goes back home looking for... Um, uh, for sexual relations with their uh, still living spouse or partner. And um, so often these, the vampires were conjured as a reason why a lot of people were dying. So frequently this would happen, something would happen mysteriously, a lot of people in the community died, they had to have a reason for it, and they would think perhaps a vampire has come back, and that's why people are dying. In ancient folklore, a vampire was described as being bloated, ruddy in complexion, so uh, they were not the gaunt, pale-looking vampire that we see in the movies today, or that you associate with the Dracula legend. They were instead uh, these bloated, reddish, their uh, teeth were reddish, they may have blood dripping from their mouth. And uh, when the corpse itself was uncovered, it was felt that the vampire would show evidence that they had continued living in the grave to some degree, so their hair and their nails would have grown or so it was thought. Now, as we'll talk about, of course, that um, uh, the process of decomposition leads to the appearance that the hair and the nails are still growing, although they're actually not, but we'll talk about that in a second. But, um, uh, but it was believed that these things were evidence that the corpse was somebody that had uh, come back to life, in essence. So vampires could be created in several different ways. And curiously, the most persistent belief that I find through folklore is if a corpse or a dead body is jumped over or stepped over by an animal, either a dog or a cat, that will then create a vampire. So uh, as simple as that. Um, it was also felt that if a body died with a wound that was not treated with boiling water, it would then become a vampire. And this may play into some of the uh, theories for what generated the early legends, as we'll see in a minute. But again, it was felt this could, this could cause that. Uh, later legends suggested that the bite of the vampire would bring on vampirism in the victim. But that was not a feature of most of the legends, and certainly not the earlier folkloric legends, so, which is curious because, as we'll see in a minute, an attempt to explain this on a neurological basis 
actually invokes transmissible diseases. But early on, the plight of the vampire was not really transmitted directly by a bite. It was the vampire was created by other means. And as I said earlier, people who died in mysterious circumstances or people who committed suicide were often thought to be in peril of becoming a vampire after death because of the nature of their death. Now, vampires can be identified in several different ways. But one of the common methods that people search for vampires, if there were a bunch of people dying in the community and you thought maybe there's a vampire, they would often take a virgin boy, place him on the back of a virgin horse. Do not ask me how they could identify <laughs> these qualities. And then the horse, especially a black horse in some areas, or a white horse in other areas, so a horse of pure color at any rate, would be led through the cemetery, and that horse was said to balk at the grave of a vampire. So the horse would happily step over graves until it came to the grave of the vampire, and then it wouldn't step over that grave. Um, so you can easily see how you could uh, sort of create that. The corpse, when it was uncovered, would often be considered to appear healthier than it should appear. Um, so it would, again, have this ruddy complexion, or would appear bloated or full. And it was considered by the, by the uh, ancient people, or not so ancient perhaps, but the uneducated people, that the corpse ought to look like it's shrinking from decay. And so they didn't understand the process of decay. And they thought if it was bloated and full, then it must be roaming around and feeding. How else could it grow like this? So again, blood may be found on the mouth or the face. And this was taken as a sign that this was a vampire. They'd been out eating uh, blood. And so that's the only reason it would be there. Uh, then if the corpse were uh, disturbed, or especially if the corpse were staked, and as I'll talk about in a minute, uh, that was one of the ways of getting rid of the vampire, was staking the body. So if a stake were driven into the body, the corpse would emit a groan often. And this was taken as a sure sign that this was a vampire, because it was making a noise, and it was groaning. And as we'll talk about in a minute, there's a perfectly solid scientific explanation for why that would happen. Um, you can protect yourself from vampires in any of a number of ways. Apotropiacs are, that's the term for something that will ward off a revenant or ward off an undead person. And that can include any number of things, including strong smelling vegetables like garlic uh, or branches of wood that is considered to have holy significance. The wild rose plant and the hawthorn are most commonly cited. In Ireland, the hawthorn is called the skuch and it's considered a holy bush or a holy tree and a holy wood. And so this figures into a lot of the legends. Also, of course, religious symbols like a crucifix or the Eucharist or holy water were said to ward off the vampire. Uh, in some of the legends, vampires couldn't cross moving water or walk on consecrated ground. So if you went into a church, that would be a refuge from the vampire because they can't cross the consecrated ground to get into the church. Um, it was also considered uh, in later legends that vampires could only enter a building if they were invited in. Once they were invited in, they could come and go as they pleased, but they had to be invited at first. So if you were in the house and you just never invited the vampire in, you were safe. He couldn't come in to get you. Um, and one of the most curious things I found was that it was considered if you're being chased by a vampire, all you have to do is throw something on the ground that is miliary, you would say, so salt, or a bunch of little seeds, the vampire is obligated to stop and count every one of the grains in virtually all of the old legends. And this is interesting. So thus, the spreading of salt around an area would prevent the vampire from being an issue because he's too busy counting the salt grains, uh, which I just find endlessly funny. Um, <laughs> anyway, you can get rid of the vampire by, of course, staking the vampire. That was the most common method, and you, often using ash or hawthorn wood. In Romania, iron was used. So iron was considered to be um, something that evil people could not tolerate. An iron rod driven into the corpse would prevent it from becoming a, name, a vampire or end its life as a vampire. And in fact, several corpses have been discovered in Romania with iron rods driven through the body of the corpse. So it was thought that they were trying to either protect them from being a vampire or cure them from vampirism. Usually, they were staked through the heart, but in Russia, curiously, always through the mouth. And for some reason in Serbia, always through the stomach. So thus, maybe some cultural significance there, but we'll see. 
And for recalcitrant cases, when it was thought that the staking wasn't enough, the body might even be destroyed, either dismembered, decapitated, or even burned in some cases. So they were pretty vigorous in trying to get rid of the vampire in uh, these older societies. The more modern vampire, of course, um, we got to know through the writings of this man, Bram Stoker. The earliest of the vampire novels was really at the beginning of the 19th century, um, a, a novel actually called Vampire, and that led to several little penny novels, or what they called penny dreadfuls, uh, which included a character named Barney the Vampire, which sounds like a children's thing, but believe me, it wasn't. It was a gruesome kind of creature who went about committing mayhem. The Penny Dreadfuls were a series of little novels which cost a penny, and they were called dreadful because the content was dreadful, <laughs> not the writing. Uh, but all, I would wager the writing was probably pretty dreadful, too. But nevertheless, the Penny Dreadful series would include this Barney the Vampire. Well, along comes in, in the late 19th century, Bram Stoker published his novel uh, Dracula in 1897. And uh, interestingly, there's another Irish connection. Bram Stoker is Irish. He was born in Clontarf in Dublin. Um, his family, of course, dug with the other foot, as they say. He was Protestant. But uh, as many of the educated people in Dublin were, moved to London and managed a theater. But early on, he had met some writers from Hungary, from the Carpathian Mountains. And that may have influenced his choice of setting for the novel. And Dracula, of course, Famously, Stoker linked to a historical feature, Vlad Tepes, or Vlad the Impaler, although the connection is tenuous at best. And uh, Stoker created several qualities of the vampire, which we associate with the vampire through movies and stories today, but which were not present in folkloric vampires, such as the idea of transmitting vampirism by a bite, uh, or the idea that vampires don't like the sun and try to stay out of the sunlight. So earlier legends, the vampire was diurnal. It could be uh, up during the day. But in Stoker's novel, Dracula would avoid the sunlight. And uh, so several other qualities were taken from his novel, which actually is a, uh, not a bad novel. Um, so where did all this come from? There have been attempts to try to explain uh, where the legends arose. One of the most popular uh, uh, Anthropological explanations is that ignorance of the process of decomposition led people to think that the body or the corpse that had been examined was living, was going on to live after death or had been reanimated in some way. So in certain areas where the ground was very wet or where the atmosphere is very humid, the body might not decompose quite the same way. There could be a process of saponification in which the fats were turned basically to soap, almost, a waxy-like substance. And so the corpse may look healthier than it actually was um, when it was exhumed. The other thing was, as I was saying, the corpse was often bloated, and that was from the production of gases by the process of decomposition. But earlier people didn't understand that, so they thought they should be emaciated and wasting away to a skeleton when really they would be, at that point, bloated. The process of uh, gaseous production will also lead to the noises the corpse would make when it was disturbed or when you drove a stake through its heart. The gas would escape through the vocal cords and then there would be a groan or a sound. Yes? Why all the exhumations? Well, this was when, again, there were, when a lot of people died in the community, people would get the idea that perhaps the, um, uh, there was a vampire that was responsible. So the legends originally, uh, where did they come from? How did you get the idea that somebody had come back to life and was wandering around? Um, originally, then, it might not be from the mistaken uh, belief about the decomposition, unless there was a lot of grave robbing that went on back in those days, too. And so people would often come in contact with corpses uh, because they were breaking into the grave for other reasons. And so they would see the body then and not understand why it looked the way it did and would assume that it had somehow come back to life. And the theory is that that may have spawned some of the early stories. So later, when a bunch of people mysteriously die, you think maybe one of these bodies has come back to life and is creeping around and killing people. So we go look for them. And as I say, you know, they find them in various ways, dig up the body. And it, usually they would identify someone who had recently died as being likely the vampire because they would be turned into a vampire soon after death. So they wouldn't wait 20 years to become a vampire. It would be right after death. So they were always looking for somebody who had recently died, and they would find people in these earlier stages of decomposition. 
and then not understanding it, they would think that they're all ruddy and bloated because they're active and feeding. Um, the blood around the mouth, of course, was often because the gases would push the blood out through the mouth. And uh, depending on the circumstances of death, the blood may still be uh, liquid. And when they found liquid blood, and especially dripping from the mouth, they assumed that they must have been going out and eating that blood from other people. And so the misunderstanding of this decomposition was considered to possibly lead to the theory that these people were getting up out of the grave and going around and uh, drinking blood from other people. In a lot of these areas, too, the graves were relatively shallow compared to what we do, and so it was easier for the grave to be uncovered, say, by a dog uh, or a wolf. Um, another theory is that contagion might have accounted for this, so a mysterious virus sweeping through the population would lead to all of the deaths, and then the assumption was made that it must be one of the undead coming back. So the role that this played was probably uh, substantial in some cases, but um, uh, a proposition in 1985 by a biochemist was that porphyria might be the cause of some of the vampire legends. And, uh, you know, porphyria, the disorder of heme metabolism, there are several forms that I won't go into uh, for time's sake, but uh, Dr. Dolphin suggested that um, one of the reasons that porphyria could account for this is that you treat porphyria with an infusion of heme, and so these people were self-treating by going out and drinking blood. Now, of course, immediately you can probably see the most serious flaw in this theory, so that drinking blood through the mouth is hardly replacing the heme in the bloodstream, which we do to treat some forms of porphyria. Uh, but nevertheless, this was the theory for a dolphin that, they, that vampires were self-treating porphyriacs, so to speak. Um, also, his, he, uh, Dr. Dolphin said, because many of the sufferers from porphyria avoid sunlight, because as you know, the heme products can react with sunlight and cause a, a serious skin reaction. So people who have porphyria often have to stay out of the bright light or stay away from the sunlight. And he said this would explain why vampires are, were um, uh, avoided the sunlight. But as I said a minute ago, the problem with that is they didn't avoid sunlight in the old folklore. It was only in the more recent novels, such as uh, Stoker's Dracula, where vampires were nocturnal uh, exclusively. So most people discount the theory that porphyria had much to do with the vampire legends. Um, a more interesting supposition, though, was published in the Green Journal, in the Journal of Neurology in the late 1990s. Uh, Dr. Gomez Alonso, a Spanish neurologist, suggested that perhaps rabies was an explanation for the vampire legends, or at least some of the vampire legends. I told you to be a neurological connection. So, uh, And the suggestion that rabies could explain this came from several observations that Dr. Alonso made. One is that rabies is transmitted by the bite of the sufferer. So the person who is bitten by, a rabid person, is in peril of developing rabies, thus spreading the disease. Um, furious rabies, uh, the most common form in humans, produces this tendency to attack others or attempt to bite others. So the person or animal with furious rabies tries to bite. And this is seen as maybe um, an explanation for why we would conceive of them as being a vampire. They're going around trying to bite people and that's what we say vampires do. Also, the, the sufferer from rabies will often have a bloody frothing at the mouth. Um, I actually remember I was a resident when we had our human case of rabies here in the hospital uh, in Little Rock, and I remember that patient actually did have, uh, as I was told, a frothing at the mouth, although um, uh, fortunately I didn't get to take care of him directly, so I didn't get inoculated, but at any rate. Rabid patients are often hypersensitive. They may avoid bright light. They may avoid strong smells. So a rabid patient may be averse to garlic. And so this was, again, uh, Dr. Alonzo said, you know, that, that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, involvement of limbic structures by the rabies virus can lead to this furious behavior. It can also lead to disturbance of sleep and can lead to hypersexual behavior. There are many reports of rabid patients having sexual intercourse multiple times in a day, and that goes along, Dr. Alonzo said, with some of the early vampire legends, which emphasize the hypersexuality of the vampire. Um, 
further, he said that uh, um, rabies, of course, is associated with wolves, bats, and dogs. And wolves and bats, in particular, are often associated with vampires in some of the legends. Now, interestingly, you know, the idea was that you get rabies from bats and you can get rabies from wolves, and and so that may also help to explain why the vampire was associated with wolves and bats. Now. Um, uh, does this theory hold water? Well, it's an interesting theory, and perhaps someone in earlier times who developed rabies, and rabies was not tremendously uncommon back in those days, but perhaps someone who developed rabies could be taken as potentially a vampire because of some of the qualities. However, of course, rabies is a very limited disease, and they don't live very long. So the other problem is some of these parallels are parallels with modern literary vampires and not with older folkloric vampires. So it doesn't really explain the earlier legends of vampires as neatly as Dr. Alonzo would like, but it's an interesting theory, and um, there's no real way to test that, but I think most people discount, most anthropologists discount this as a serious contender for an explanation. Uh, more than likely, the vampire is simply part of the ancient folklore that has come to us. There is actually a syndrome of clinical vampirism. So in psychiatry and in behavioral neurology, we may encounter people who believe themselves to be vampires and believe that they have the need to feed on the blood of others. Now this was this is also known as Renfield's syndrome. Renfield was a psychiatric patient in the novel Dracula that the vampire recruited to help him. Renfield was crazy. But Renfield developed the desire to drink blood himself in emulation of his master. And so it was proposed that we call this Renfield syndrome. Allegedly, this consists of people who derive sexual pleasure from drinking blood, blood from humans. The interesting thing is this syndrome was created as a parody of the DSM in 1992. So a Dr. Nall, a psychologist, thought that all of this business of trying to um, to uh, give uh, theory-neutral terms for psychiatric diseases was hogwash, and he didn't really think this was valid, so he created Renfield syndrome as a joke. And to his surprise, it took hold, and so people <laughs> have propagated it as something that uh, some people believe this actually is a real psychiatric disorder. It is not recognized in any psychiatric text, by the way, as a real disorder. <clears throat> One of the problems is there are very, very few cases, a handful of cases have been described of people who might have what was thought to be Renfield syndrome. There have been some infamous murderers who were known to drink the blood of their victims, but it is they were not thought to think of themselves as vampires. They had other reasons for that. They were just crazy. Um, and so they didn't really think of themselves as being a vampire drinking the blood, in other words. And this is to totally distinct from the lifestyle of vampires. So uh, vampiric lifestyle um, is there are actually people who say that they live the lifestyle of the vampire as a life choice. And so uh, interesting thing. But that's think, different. Do you think the fact that a nightclub resident? <laughs> <laughs> yes. We want to test those people. Okay, um, so let's move on to talk about the second monster, werewolves. Werewolves are another ancient kind of monster, also known by many, many other names. Lycanthrope comes from uh, the Greek root words meaning wolf and man, and so the lycanthrope is a werewolf, or what we'd recognize as a werewolf. The French refer to this as the loup garou. They borrowed one of the words from the Germanic language, and so the loup garou was the French form of the werewolf. Um, a werewolf is essentially a human that can shift into the shape of a wolf. The concept is widespread throughout European folklore, but focuses in France and Germany, of all things. So the vampires focus in Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe, the Balkans, uh, the Slavic lands. The werewolf legends focus in Germany and to some degree in France. So the belief developed parallel to the belief in witches, and there were many trials of werewolves that ran in parallel to trials of witches in Europe. So there are many famous cases. Um, the concept traces far back into uh, Proto-Indo-European mythology, the idea of shifting into a different shape and assuming the form of, a, of another animal. And strongly influenced by the wolf in German paganism, 
Uh, if you'll remember too, the wolf is probably the most recent of the human predators that uh, the European people would know. So wolves actually preyed on humans. And remember, uh, even a couple of hundred years ago, you had to be careful going from town to town. You could become the victim of a wolf. And so the wolf would play large in mythology and in fear uh, because they would still eat you back in those days. And so wolves were very important in the mythology. Lycanthropy, though, is mentioned as far back as the ancient Greek uh, and Roman texts, and there are Roman legends about people being turned into wolves. There were numerous reports of werewolf attacks in France in the 16th and 17th century, and again, there were many, many trials, and the, the trials, the werewolf trials focused in France, but the legends were more Germanic in nature, and so the Germans actually, uh, during the Nazi years, the Nazis used the term werewolf as a code name for Hitler's hideout in one case, and a code name for a military operation late in the war to create commandos to go behind the lines of the Allies. It was Operation Werewolf, the only time those were used as military terms. Werewolf's characteristics were the transformation could be temporary, could be permanent, and the were animal might be the man himself, or it might be just a double uh, acting in his place. In human form, the werewolf was said to be a bit different from regular humans in that they had the unibrow. They had, their eyebrows would meet in the middle of the forehead. That was one characteristic. The ears might be low set, um, the nails curved, and it was said that werewolves in their human form had fur inside their skin, as if the skin of the wolf had been turned around inside out. And in fact, one way they would try to detect werewolves was to cut off the skin of someone to see if there was fur inside a practice which uh, was uh, associated with high mortality, shall we say. <laughs> uh, in the wolf form, however, the, the werewolf was indistinguishable from other wolves, except that it had no tail. So that was the only difference between the werewolf in the wolf form. So this is different from the popular movie Wolfman, which looked like a hairy man, and also plays into some of the theories, medical theories, about what may have caused this. How did you become a werewolf? Well, in the old uh, legends, you simply put on a wolf skin. You take off your clothes and put on a wolf skin or a belt made from the skin of a wolf and it would turn you into the wolf and you'd become a werewolf uh, simply by doing that. Or, in many uh, legends, drinking water from the footprint of a wolf would turn you into a werewolf. I cannot possibly imagine a situation where you would want to drink water from the footprint of a wolf. <laughs> However, this recurs over and over again in the ancient folklore and perhaps it's something we made up as you know, if we accuse this guy of being a werewolf, we say he drank water out of a wolf's footprint. Eating human entrails was also said to lead to turning into a werewolf. And in several of the very early legends, the person became a werewolf from eating the remains of humans. So cannibalism plays into the werewolf theories. And also, werewolves may be created by magical incantations or divine curses. St. Patrick himself, the patron saint of Ireland, is said to have turned one of the ancient Celtic princes into a wolf and uh, therefore created a werewolf. And there's the ancient Greek theory, or the Greek story of Ly uh, Lycaon, who, was, who fed uh, human remains to Zeus secretly, and in punishment, Zeus turned him into a wolf. And so, again, there's a lot of parallel or a lot of uh, um, sort of cannibalism involved with this. So modern werewolves... Uh, date from gothic horror novels from the 19th century. And a lot of the nature of werewolves has changed in these modern tales. Werewolves were described in more recent uh, series of being sensitive to silver. So, And the werewolf was supposedly impervious to almost anything except silver. So you could dispatch them with a silver bullet. That, was, that shows up in the movie Werewolves, but not in the old legends. Transformation into the wolf or wolfman occurred in the presence of the full moon in modern stories, but not in the old stories so much. So lycanthropy supposedly is transmitted in the newer stories, either genetically, you inherit it in your family, or from the bite of a werewolf. But again, that was not in the old stories, the old folkloric uh, werewolves. So where did werewolves come from? Is there a medical explanation? Actually, very early on, the supposition was that depression or melancholy could lead to the idea of being a werewolf. And some people thought that that would lead directly to becoming a werewolf. Um, and, uh, and in fact, uh, clinical lycanthropy, as I'll show in this, or talk about in a second, often is associated with severe depression. 
Porphyria was also proposed as a cause of werewolf legends because some people with porphyria will develop excess hair and they may develop discoloration of the skin. Again, they may be um, averse to sunlight and they may develop neuropsychiatric symptoms. However, porphyria is not a very good explanation for the werewolf theory in more ways than for the vampire theory, so it doesn't account for the historical legends. Rabies has also been proposed as a, as a uh, cause for the werewolf legends, because again, here you have a direct uh, a relation to wolves in the form of the disease itself, and it's transmitted again by a bite, but once again, that was not in the original stories. So rabies is probably not a very good explanation for where werewolves came from. Clinical lycanthropy refers to the psychiatric syndrome in which people believe that they can transform or have transformed into an animal or may have the qualities of being a wolf or another animal. And lycanthropy, although it derives from the words for wolf and man, is expanded in this sense to refer to someone who believes they've been changed into any kind of animal. So this includes people, uh, one famous case of a man who felt he'd been turned into a rabbit and was noted to hop around on the psychiatric ward like a rabbit. And so that's considered clinical lycanthropy. In a, the largest series to date of 12 um, American lycanthropes or people who had this delusion, the underlying psychiatric disorder was identified as um, bipolar disorder in half of the patients. So six of them were manic at the time of their lycanthropy. Two were simply depressed, very severe depression. Two had schizophrenia, one with a typical psychosis, and one had severe borderline personality disorder. And in severe cases, borderline personality disorder may be associated with delusions. So again, clinical lycanthropy appears to be basically a delusional syndrome. Um, and it's curious to me, having seen a lot of people with delusional syndromes, that uh, this is not common at all. So it's a fairly rare form. Um, thinking that you've turned into a werewolf. Now, an interesting paper, I thought interesting, published in the Canadian Medical Journal in 1992 and published with no real explanation, is this paper which talks about the pharmacology of lycanthropy. Now, notice the author's names. There's W.M. Davis, <laughs> who's a pharmacologist at the University of Mississippi, um, or it may be Mississippi State, but he's in Mississippi. <laughs> the the second is I'm Well kid. Wolf. Are you kidding? And look at the third one is <laughs> Lou Garou. Remember a minute ago, the French name for a werewolf is Lou Garou, spelled in the French. Uh, but he has Lou Garou with an anglicized spelling, an O-U kid. So he talks about here, if you look at the design, quadruple blind Rubik's Cube matrix analysis. <laughs> Setting is community practice and malpractice. And he actually talks in here about, about studying people from a little known tribe of Aboriginal people called the Nasarika. And when you spell that, that's American, spell backwards, spell backwards. The Nasarika had a sub tribe called the Rupakala. The root words mean red neck. <laughs> so, anyway, so he's making fun of Southerners in a way, but anyway, and it's, a, it's fascinating. It this actually, you can look this up, this is actually published in the CMAJ, uh, and uh, just straight out as a, just an article. Really the funny. publication date was April 1st, ah. so anyway, so it was an April Fool's joke. Anyway, uh, all right. the third monster that I wanted to touch on was zombies. Uh, zombies come from Haiti. The original uh, legends come from Haiti. It was an animated corpse raised by magical means, popularly associated with voodoo religion. And you'll note the spelling of voodoo, whoops, it is misspelled. There's two O's at the first. But uh, voodoo is not B-O-O-D-O-O. -O -O. That refers to the Louisiana form of voodoo, which is different. So the Haitian religion, folk religion, was voodoo. Um, but uh, uh, zombism is not part of the formal practice. It was believed that a zombie was created by a bokor, sorcerer, sorcerer, and the zombie would uh, be under the power of the bokor, so it would have to do what the bokor wanted them to do. Um, the zombie cadaver refers to the actual reanimated body and has no soul, so it's a reanimated body that moves around slowly, has a fixed stare because there's no soul involved. There's also the zombie astral, which is when the soul is separated from the body, and the bokor can keep the soul in a little painted bottle or in a fetish and can use the power of that soul to enhance the bokor's own power. 
So the two types of zombies reflect the Haitian religious belief in uh, soul dualism. So there's the physical soul and the uh, spiritual soul, and they can actually be separated. And in the case of the zombie, um, the two types of zombies reflect that. It's felt by uh, the, the practitioners of the religion that God will, at some point, take back the soul. So the zombie state is meant to be temporary. And curiously, zombies can be cured by feeding them salt. So if you feed salt to the zombie, they become a freed person again, um, for what that's worth. So zombies really became known after the U.S. occupied Haiti, and there was a novel called The Magic Island written by William Seabrook, which introduced the zombie to popular culture. Um, in pop culture, however, zombies have now been transformed. So the original was, again, a myth prevalent in folk society and related to folk religion. The modern pop zombies that you see on TV are loosely, if at all, connected with the Haitian zombies. Uh, literary antecedents would include reanimated corpses such as Frankenstein's Monster, which was published around uh, the turn of the 19th century, actually, so quite uh, early. And um, uh, the archetype of the pop zombie was established only in the 1960s with George Romero's horror film, Night of the Living Dead. Interestingly, zombie was not used in that movie. It was only after the movie that somebody suggested that these reanimated corpses in the horror movie were like the legend of the zombie, and Romero latched onto it, and then they became zombies. And after that, he became associated with creating the pop zombie. They're portrayed as mindless, lumbering, reanimated corpses intent on consuming human flesh. And in the new um, uh, <clears throat> idea, it can be transmitted from person to person. So if you're bitten by a zombie, you turn into a zombie yourself. Uh, there's also this recent notion of the zombie apocalypse, which uh, is the idea that zombies would spread as an illness so quickly that the government and authorities would not be able to contain it, and the entire society would collapse under the weight of everyone turning into a zombie. And this actually was used by the Centers for Disease Control as an idea to spread education about preparation for epidemics. So, in, so the CDC actually issued guidelines for how to prepare for the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> and it was done tongue-in-cheek, but with a serious intent to teach people about how to prepare for something like a viral pandemic. And that was the idea, although I'm not sure I agree that was a good idea. Um, the uh, Wade Davis, now where did zombies come from? Wade Davis, a Harvard ethnobotanist, proposed a chemical hypothesis to account for these and proposed that people were intentionally poisoned using two types of poisons together. One of those was um, derived from pufferfish and included tetrodotoxin. If you remember, that is a sodium channel uh, blocker which causes paralysis and can actually, in the right dose, produce a state that looks like clinical death. So the idea was that the poisoner, in this case, would poison the person with tetrodotoxin to make them appear dead, and then they would be buried. And then he could go dig them up, and they would reanimate after the poison wore off. He would then he would be, have given them a second powder, which included um, a dissociative drug, uh, such as could be derived from any of the plants, several of the plants growing in Haiti, and these drugs would produce a hallucinatory state so that the person would come under the power of the poisoner now because they would be essentially psychotic after their ordeal. And then if they tried to return to their family, the family would reject them because they had already buried them. And they would say, now you're a zombie. You've been reanimated. They would block them out. The idea was the poisoner would then have them at their will. Now, Davis proposed this was a way that plantation owners could get uh, new slaves labor for their plantation to work the fields. You would do this, and this person would then be beholden to you, and they'd have to live with you, and they'd have to work for you on your farm, and um, and that was a great way to generate more workers for your farm. Now, the hole in this theory is it's difficult to calculate the dose of tetrodotoxin that would produce the near-death state without creating a death state. <laughs> so... It would be, you would commonly kill the person you're trying to turn into a zombie. And the second thing is, very often, because they have been in this hypoxic state for a while, when they come around, they have brain damage. So that's not a really good farm worker, somebody who's brain damaged and can't walk or can't do things very well. 
that's not a good way to generate farm labor. The other thing is Haiti's very poor, and there are so many people looking for work, you can easily get farm labor very cheap. So it doesn't make sense to go to the expense and the trouble of trying to create a zombie workforce when you could just hire the people. You know? <laughs> so um, in any event, so it's not really a good social theory. However, this actually has been verified by some of the Bokors as a way in which they try to create a zombie when they're trying to bring someone under a magical spell. So for their magical reasons. The Bokor, again, is considered to be a sorcerer in the voodoo religion, not a priest, and often discouraged, the practice is discouraged by the priests. So they're trying to use their magic to put this person under their spell for some reason. And a paper published in The Lancet in the late 1990s examined the cases of three people who are identified as zombies and found that in one of those cases it was a person who probably had been poisoned in this fashion by a bokor and then brought back to life. The person had evidence of hypoxic brain damage on imaging, was hardly uh, a useful worker. The other two cases they discovered, interestingly, one was a catatonic schizophrenic who wandered into town and a family who had lost their daughter imagined that she was their lost daughter, although she was actually not. And another case was simply mistaken identity. Someone wandered into town homeless and the family adopted her as their long lost uh, dead relative who had been reanimated. And so many of the cases of zombies were due to that. So Lang, the Scottish psychiatrist, suggested this social hypothesis and suggested that mental illness or homelessness would be seen as evidence that a lost loved one had returned from the dead. And mental illnesses like catatonic schizophrenia would produce someone who may be lumbering, slow, have a vacant stare on their face, and be psychotic, and this may be interpreted as a zombie-like state. So they would then say, the other villagers would say, this is a zombie. And then, as I say, many cases may result from uh, mistaken identification. So all of these um, uh, monsters have some potential scientific theories for where the legends came from. But for the most part, I think these legends arose out of folk beliefs and mythology and have been embellished over the years. Most of our ideas of what these monsters are derived from Hollywood and TV and have little resemblance to the original folkloric uh, creatures. And so I don't think any of these uh, so-called scientific explanations ring true. There are clinical forms of the monsters, the clinical vampire, the clinical werewolf, there, interestingly, the clinical zombies generally have all occurred in Haiti, <laughs> where the folk belief probably influences the belief that they're zombies. And could you say that's a psychotic state? Well, it's not really that the person themselves embraces the idea that I have become a zombie. Uh, they may be a schizophrenic, and they're identified by the other people in their family or the village as a zombie, but they don't develop a delusion that they're a zombie. So I don't think you could really link it to a psychiatric disease. The clinical lycanthrope, yes, they may believe that they are able to turn into a wolf, but that's an, actually a very rare psychiatric or neuropsychiatric condition. And curiously, although we see a lot of people with um, uh, delusions in dementia, I, we don't see anybody with dementia that believes they're changing into a wolf. Uh, I've never encountered that, and it's not really reported in the literature as a common feature of the delusions of dementia. The delusion of being a vampire, being someone dead who is raised from the dead, resembles the delusion of Cotard. The Cotard syndrome is a delusional syndrome in which a person believes that they've died or that they're dead. It usually involves some belief that part of their body or their internal organs are missing. Um, but uh, And this may occur in dementia, and I've seen that several times. But in no case does the person believe that they are someone who has been brought back from the dead. They believe they are dead. So they don't believe that they are an undead vampire who can go around and drink blood from other people. They simply believe that they are now a corpse, and they're dead. And most of the people I've seen with Cotard syndrome want to be buried. And so, uh, so they actually think that they really have died. So I don't think that's a very common explanation. So the, the medical forms of these monsters, I think, are, are fairly rare. And I wouldn't really say they're a unique clinical syndrome. If they occur, they occur as part of another delusional syndrome. And I think it's actually remarkable that it's so rare, given the heavy prevalence of these monsters in pop culture. So why don't more deluded, uh, deluded people uh, get the idea that they've turned into a vampire or a werewolf? Uh, I don't know. You know, it's curious. So uh, it's not a very common thing. 
And um, so tonight you can you can go home after work and dress up as one of these monsters if you'd like and uh, go out and terrorize the neighborhood, but don't claim that you have a psychiatric disease. <laughs> 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 Questions or comments? Yes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my, you know, a lot of the uh, you know, 19th century crazy people who had delusions and stuff were actually uh, had tertiary syphilis. Oh, yeah. And might that have something to do with the fact that we don't see that much tertiary syphilis anymore? Well, that's an interesting idea because syphilis would certainly cause uh, a psychotic syndrome. And um, so, I, you know, I don't recall anyone suggesting syphilis as a potential contributing factor, but yeah, I would have to think that would be um, for some of these syndromes at least. Again, because, the, um, because both the werewolf and the vampire have heavy sexual undertones, and, you know, so I, I wonder about that. That's interesting, you know, I have to check that. Yes? Uh, thinking about ruddy corpses, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning might provide that. Yeah, that's also true. Um, and in the old days, with um, homes being heated by open fires, <laughs> so so that's actually, that's a great suggestion. So would carbon monoxide poisoning account for some of the discoloration? It's said, too, that um, um, a corpse that has, of a body, or of a person who has died by asphyxiation, as you would with carbon monoxide, the blood tends to be liquid more often after death, and that could also, that's presumed to be one of the ways that rabies could account for the corpse later being identified as a vampire because they die generally from asphyxiation, ultimately, and, um, and that may lead to more commonly liquid blood. And I think the same would be true for carbon monoxide poisoning. And I suspect that a lot of different medical conditions which could lead to death might create a corpse that would be misinterpreted as being a vampire, so it may be kind of a final common folkloric pathway. Yes? Is it just coincidental that none of the cultures you mentioned use mummification? Evidently, that's, this is not uh, any kind of myth that is active in those cultures. Right. I think in, the, in ancient Egypt, where they did practice mummification intentionally, um, an embalming, a form of embalming, they did have werewolf legends, but although they weren't called werewolves, but they did have shape-shifting legends but you'll note the werewolf wasn't a dead person come back from life. They were someone who changed into an animal, and, um, and they were alive.